All right, we are talking again about gun violence. And that, of course, is because in the wake of Uvalde and the Buffalo shooting, so two separate, extremely tragic shootings that uh, unfortunately cannot be undone, uh, gun violence has become one of the top topics of conversation. And I remember it wasn't very long ago that similar conversations were happening around the Parkland massacre. And if you go back even further, there was Sandy Hook and there was a Fort Hood shooting and the Pulse nightclub and Columbine. And uh, there have been several other ones, Virginia Tech, which actually happened when I was not living in the US. Uh, all of these shootings have to punctuate and the reason I'm repeating them is because, uh, you know, we shouldn't forget that these things have happened, right? These things should not be forgotten, and we should always be careful that people um, don't feel that just because you have a certain opinion on a topic that you're uh, <clears throat> dismissing the problem, which is that people do get murdered often with firearms okay i'm not saying that people get murdered often but one of the weapons of choice is firearms and whichever side that you stand on with respect to the second amendment and the right to keep and bear arms you should at least talk about these shootings in a, an analytical way if you can uh but obviously i can't tell other people how to express themselves that's just my advice. Uh, why are we talking about this today? Because uh, as a person who is a staunch Second Amendment defender and a believer in the right to keep and bear arms for all Americans, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, religious uh, persuasion, sexual orientation, uh, all of the categories, I think you, you should be allowed to, um, you know, keep and bear arms simply because it's a legal right. You know, it's something that's been established in our constitution. And the idea that we're now going to be able to solve the problem of gun violence because uh, these people have been murdered, tragically, these, these uh, in, in one case it was a lot of children, 19 children, two adult teachers. In the other case it was 11, I believe it was 11 adults that might've ended up being more. Um, it shouldn't necessarily be, um, you know, it shouldn't be, be exploited. That's what I should say in order to say, well, now, now we have to have the solution because the solution that they're proposing is not a new solution. The solution that they're proposing is already, it's a failed solution that has been tried countless times in the past, which is to mandate gun control. And unfortunately, this is, this is something I'm going to tell people, this is a hard truth, okay? There is no way to solve the epidemic of gun violence apart from protecting yourself and being aware of your surroundings and, and looking out for yourself and the people around you. Because the federal government and, and the various state governments that support uh, gun control, they have not succeeded when they do try to implement them. And why is it? Because we've had past uh, attempts at it through things like the uh, assault weapons ban of the early um, the early 1990s I think it was implemented in 1994 uh, there was also the war on drugs okay why am I mentioning the war on drugs aren't we talking about guns the reason is because the same problems that we've encountered when prosecuting this war on, on drugs which has been a failure will probably be, um, you know, in equal parts applicable to the war on guns, possibly even worse. Okay. And I want to make it clear just because I think the war on drugs has been a failure. doesn't mean I advocate for drug use. It doesn't mean I advocate for, um, you know, giving people, uh, you know, <laughs> all the leeway in the world when they sell unsafe products to people. It, I'm just telling you that the war on drugs, the whole federal effort to interdict 
drug use and force people to come clean by using the prosecution of uh, of, of all of these um, criminal enterprises. Look, it, t- talking about this in moralistic terms is 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 uh, meaningless. Okay, people ought to know that when you use heroin, <laughs> it's it's a terrible life decision, and people ought to know that when you misuse firearms in order to harm other people as opposed to in order to protect yourself or the people around you, that is also a terrible life decision. And that's something I think we should, uh, you know, (laughs) we we shouldn't have to tell people, but apparently it is. Uh, So don't do heroin and and don't use your weapons to assault other people. Don't use your weapons in, in, uh, in offensive capacities. Now that I've said that, <laughs> is it going to, isn't going to bring anybody to the table who is on the pro gun control side? No, the reason it isn't is because, uh, most of these people are transparently, um, extreme and, and ideological in their disposition to the point where they, they don't really want to talk about what, uh, owning firearms entails, what the, the technical details about these firearms are. They, they, they think of them as semantics. A very good video that I saw this weekend, I, I, I actually didn't see it, I was listening to it. It was on YouTube, was from the YouTuber Nuance Bro, who has a channel that uh, often he'll go to public places and he'll have a jug of water and a microphone and a, and a cameraman, and he'll talk to people and gauge their opinions. And, and it's clear what his bias is usually, but he doesn't try to bully people into taking his side. And, and when he w- went to Houston to cover the protesters and the attendees at the NRA National Convention, which I am not an NRA supporter, but he went. Um, <laughs> if you, there's a clear difference in tone and, and uh, mental clarity when you hear from a person who is on the attendee side and people who are on the protester side. The difference is that the people who are attending the convention seem to be very uh, focused on, you know, looking at the new trade and looking at some of the, and and meeting people, networking, things like that. Uh, Obviously that's not a moral position. That's simply, uh, you know, a mood and state of mind. And the people who are protesters are angry and argue, not just argumentative, but blatantly hostile to any person who offers questions about their ideas regarding gun control. Remember, if you're proposing a solution and you can't answer questions about the details of the solution, or you can't even articulate the solution, your position is weak and and meaningless. And that's what gun control generally has been. Uh, Unfortunately, um, while the supporters have had weak and meaningless positions often, the leadership, whether it's the politicians or the activist groups like the, the Brady campaign or uh, Giffords or um, Moms Demand Action, which is the Michael Bloomberg astroturfed organization, all of those organizations do have concrete plans, which is they, they might talk about responsible gun ownership. They might talk about common sense gun safety. They might talk about uh, universal background checks, as if those are the solutions that they're going to stop at. But the reality is that they are m- moving towards the solution that everybody knows is their only goal that can that can actually give them what they want, which is the repeal of the Second Amendment. Michael Moore said it explicitly about a week ago. He said that he's not going to hide anymore. He's in favor of repealing the Second Amendment. And and you know what? Credit to him for admitting what should have been clear for many, many years. Uh, But the the fact is that that is not a solution because confiscation of guns, mandatory buybacks is is also a, (laughs) it's a fantasy. Um, When you do buybacks, whether voluntary or mandatory, usually what will happen is the people will take um, their crappiest guns or guns that are a liability to them and they'll turn them in and use the cash in order to buy something else, that, that often another weapon, sometimes illegally, and uh, you're back to square uh, negative a billion. 
you know, there, there's been a saying that a lot of these gun control activists are around, including Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, where she says, well, there's more guns in America than there are people. So clearly we have a gun problem. Well, <laughs> let's turn that issue on its head. If there are more guns than there are people, then how come all the people are not dead? Karine Jean-Pierre and the White House don't have an answer for that because the logic of the issue escapes them. Look, um, I think that there are people who, and clearly recent history has shown, has shown this is to be correct, there are people who shouldn't be anywhere close to a firearm. And uh, unfortunately, we only focus on a number of very uh, Kodak-friendly cases. Uh, Kodak for the media. You have the Buffalo shooter, uh, you know, an explicit white supremacist with a very clear motive. And you also had the Ovalde shooter who seemed to be a deranged young man uh, in his case, Hispanic, so they left out any racial motive because there was none. none. Now, now it has to be about the gun. It cannot be about the white supremacy. So those are the two issues that they focus on. They don't focus on the fact that in New York City, which is a, you know, it's a municipality with very strict gun control, you recently had the subway Q train shooter, okay? So with all the gun control measure, um, measures that they have, that Mayor Adams and previous administrations have had the benefit of using all these years, a man got onto the subway in New York and executed another person for a, very, for an, a motive that's so far unknown. So how, how can you predict this? There's no indicator of why he did it. Okay, may, maybe there is some sort of motive, but the fact is that he did it, and he was able to get away, and, and uh, I think that at this point they have the murderer in custody, or the suspect, and um, what are you supposed to do about it? This is, it's New York City. The, these people are not deterred by any gun law, even though New York City has some of the strictest in the country, and the fact is that there are people who, and, and I believe this guy had been released several times. There was also the subway shooter from several months ago. Okay, so that guy uh, wounded a number of people. He was wearing, uh, I think, a hazmat outfit at the time. And uh, it took a long time to actually track him down and, and uh, get him into custody. And the reason that the gun control lobby completely ignored this situation and started to, and, and, and in fact, <laughs> largely stayed on the sidelines was because A, again, this was in New York City, and B, the attacker was not some uh, adolescent uh, male, uh, or uh, he was a male, but he wasn't an adolescent uh, white male. He was uh, like a middle-aged black guy. And, and uh, so, look, I don't think that you should be able to get off the hook or, or be ignored for murdering anyone uh, regardless of your race, gender, ethnicity, or whatever, or, or the victims. But it's very clear that there is a racial bias in reporting. They, they love to cover white uh, young killers, or, or if for that matter, any, any, any sort of killer who is a white person, especially if they're a white supremacist. So that's a person like the Christchurch shooter. It's a person like the Buffalo shooter. It's a person like... Um, the shooter in uh, Pittsburgh a few years ago. That was one of the reasons that actually got me off the sideline and, and I became a firearm owner. Um, so the, this, this notion that this coverage is, is simply motivated by a desire to actually solve the gun violence problem is totally disingenuous. Uh, what, what's the other issue that's going on? You have leaders of the world, uh, Justin Trudeau, and Joe Biden, who are now talking about banning handguns, okay? They started with assault weapons, and for the life of them, they, they can't really narrow down what an assault weapon is. Yes, there are little indicators. There, 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 there was a, apparently a definition back in the day, and it was more, <laughs> the, the term I've, used, I've heard more in, respect, in re reference to these is battle rifles. 
So these were um, usually not very practical. In fact, for everyday life, uh, they typically had barrels that were like over 16 inches long. And they were essentially made for taking a position, you know, charging a hill and things like that. And, and they had long barrels for, for good accuracy. And they also were clearly for a military purpose. Does that mean that they should not be owned by civilians? Absolutely not. That's my position. But the average assault rifle that they're talking about is, is actually not, um, <laughs> is not an assault rifle. Uh, they, they're usually talking about the M4 uh, carbine uh, <laughs> and its civilian uh, counterpart, the AR-15, the modern AR-15s and the AR-10s. And uh, I think there's an AR-18 also. So if you're in the comments and, and I've, I've missed something or I got something wrong, go ahead and tell me. I don't own an AR-15, but uh, they sure are very um, customizable. So, so people do like them. And, and yes, some of them are, are nicer than others. But uh, <laughs> the, the problem with their logic is that now you've had gun control advocates, including President Biden, start to say that, well, you don't need high, high caliber ammunition. You don't need, um, or, or uh, yeah, like higher caliber, I think he was the terminology he used. And he was referring to nine millimeter. Now, some people have, um, you know, given him a little bit of leeway and said, well, maybe he was talking about 5.56 five, NATO, which is the ammo that's generally used for, um, it's for uh, the, both the AR-15 and, and the majority of uh, modern carbines that are sold in the, in the U.S., okay? So the 5.56 five, ammo, I don't know how you confuse it with the 9mm. Maybe if you're totally ignorant and you've never seen either of these cartridges. But one is a rifle ammo, the other one is a handgun ammo. So the fact that he could, could have gotten confused by the two means that A, he is not focused on the topic or not uh, educated, which is also very possible with President Biden, or that he, he does mean that he's gonna <laughs> try to get nine millimeter ammo banned. And, and believe me, so, so this, this idea that they're going, that some people, including Sticks Hexenhammer, they have tried to use this, um, you know, this mental slip, which is what they think he did, in order to say, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's just Biden being himself and not having the mental focus. Well, okay, how do you explain then that literally, I think it was the same day, it was, uh, it was Monday, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada said, oh yeah, we're, we're going to ban the sale of handguns in Canada, the sale or transfer or um, acquisition of handguns in Canada, which which is a, is a an egregiously large overstep of authority for the Canadian government, right? Uh, first of all, um, <laughs> is it really justified? Is it is there is there a pandemic of gun violence in Canada? I don't know. I, I haven't heard about it. So, if you're from Canada, and I, I do have a friend from Canada. Um, chime in if you want and uh, put a comment where you say, yeah, there, there was this issue that happened. But uh, in my opinion, <laughs> Trudeau was simply virtue signaling to Biden that it's this easy. It's this easy to do it. It's this easy to implement gun control. And, and that's a message that he's throwing to the media so that they go to Biden. And they say, look, Trudeau did it. Why don't you take the courageous step and do it too. Why don't you ban the sale, acquisition, and uh, transfer of, of handguns? So, so um, look, um, I think that it is going to blow up in Biden's face. The reason for this is, I don't know what the, the statistics are in Canada, but there is a massive, a massive uh, share of the American public that owns uh, firearms, okay? And, and Canada, I believe, in, it's, it's a little bit more geared towards people living in the prairies and other more remote parts of Canada. It's not, not as much in the cities. Um, 
So, <laughs> and even if they are in the prairies and the and the other part, they, so they, they might only own rifles, right? So, um, generally handguns are, you, you know, it's not like you won't see people in the wilderness owning them, but they, they don't necessarily need them as much as a rifle. So, uh, Canada does not have the same gun owning culture as the United States. Um, and therefore Trudeau, while he probably will ruffle some feathers, is probably not going to have as much of an effect domestically, even though he should. Um, what's going to happen with Biden, though, is you're, you're going to encounter a lot of Americans who have no political opinion or who have, even might be supporters of his, and they own a 9 millimeter handgun, or they might even own, you know, smaller caliber weapons. And they might start to say, hey, you know what? You know what? Up until now, we thought you were only going for those weapons that you deemed to be dangerous and scary. And now it seems that you've also extended your definition of dangerous and scary to us. So, so what's the deal? You know, why is it that you're starting to move the goalposts and define things that up until now you thought were okay as being dangerous? That's really the hazard of what Biden is doing. It's a, it's a real problem. I think it will blow up in his face. I think it will also blow up in the face of the American people, unfortunately. Um, another another uh, point that I'm going to reiterate, something I went over in a previous podcast. I think it, it's probably in a previous podcast. But uh, a lot of times these people will try to talk about how, uh, and I'm talking about gun control advocates, weapons of war don't belong on American streets. I'm here to respond to that weapons of war, they, they, they could never pick it out of a lineup, okay? If, if they could, could pick out a rifle like the AR-15, which has never been used in a war, from the M1 Garand, from the Lee Enfield uh, Mark IV, from, you know, the, the Mosin Nagant, uh, I, I think it's the Series 8, 1893, uh, all those rifles that I just mentioned were used in a war and because they're obsolete now okay so to speak there there have been more technologically advanced rifles um generally you wouldn't think of them as as weapons of war because they don't have the modern finish they, don't, they might not have the polymer um the polymer uh, grips or anything or or any of the like the the barrel sh uh what do you call it the barrel shroud they don't they don't they don't they have a barrel shroud that's usually wood so most Americans, when they associate a rifle that is wood with anything, it's not with an assault rifle. It's generally with something like a hunting rifle. But the fact is that these weapons, they're made for war. Most Americans could not identify them as such, and they would generally overlook them, whereas they would point at the AR-15 and say, hey, that's a weapon of, of, of war. Why? Because it looks like it, not because of its function. In reality, a lot of those weapons that were used in the in both world wars, and uh, even uh, prior to that, they are still in service in some wars simply because of necessity, because supplies are low, or or because they simply function very very well. The Lee Enfield rifle, by the way, is still in service, I believe, in India. Um, that that rifle entered service in World War One. You have the um, Mosin Nagant rifle that's currently in service in Ukraine. So all this huge, this refrain that you have weapons of war on American streets, they don't know what they're talking about because, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that there aren't weapons that are impractical for day-to-day -day use, but you can't just label something a weapon of war. And then when somebody comes back to you and says, well, this isn't really used in war situations, you can't just go and say, well, the technical details are just semantics to me. That shows how ignorant you are to the topic. It shows that you're not really engaged in this in order to uh, understand the issue. You're simply re responding to the outrage. Uh, other than that, please like, share, and subscribe. You can follow all my links on social media and video hosting platforms like Odyssey, Rumble, BitChute, uh, and Minds, Gab, Getter. I'm now on Truth Social. Uh, you can find that on the link tree below, and I'll talk to you later. Have a great night.